Behind the Curtain with Jack Burton. Welcome to another edition of Behind the Curtain. As you can see, we're here in the Behind the Curtain studio coming to you. Well, you know, I'm not a talk show host. I'm not a reporter. I'm not a pundit. I'm not any of those things. I'm a lobbyist. You know, I walk the halls of Congress every day, sometimes six days a week. I go to events. I go to parties. I find you information that you can't get anywhere else. Not on any network, not on any website. There are no other lobbyists doing this. This is rare, unique, and special for you right here on Behind the Curtain. What a show we have today. We're going to be talking about America's place in the world. We'll be talking about Trump and the government shutdown. What's going to happen when they come back in September? Are you worried about a shutdown? Will your Social Security check still come to you if the government shuts down? We'll be talking about America's place in the world. Are we declining? Are we Rome? Are we falling apart? First up, Naomi Lin, breaking news reporter of the Washington Examiner. Welcome, Naomi. Thank you for having me. Well, this topic, Trump and the government shutdown, you know, I worked on the Hill in the mid-90s. I have dealt with shutdowns now for 27 years as a lawyer, as a lobbyist, as a staffer, uh, 27 years, and as now a host talking about government shutdowns. First off, prediction. Give us the lay of the land. Will the government shut shut down when the budget runs out September 30? Well, to give you the lay of the land, as you said, basically frustrated Senate Republicans agree with the president that next year's uh, federal funding should include money for his southern border wall. But they're also really desperate to avoid a government shutdown, especially just before the 2018 midterm elections. And all of this comes as Trump has like publicly demanded um, on Sunday, Monday, and Tuesday, that he wants immigration and border security legislation passed, and he suggested that a shutdown is the only way to do this. Now, the reason why Senate Republicans and Republicans in general on the Hill are frustrated is because Trump last week reportedly agreed with Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell and House Speaker Paul Ryan that Congress should look at their new like, prospective Homeland Security Appropriations Bill after the November elections and that they should just pass a continuing resolution on or by September 30th. Now, wait, who's saying this Trump? Of- now, Trump doesn't. You're saying Trump wants a CR? No, Trump wants a new new legislation passed. That Who wants the pass. CR? Who's, who's pushing for a CR? The congressional Republicans like, would because like that. Because, in other words, they- let me, so let's explain to the viewer. In other words, Mitch McConnell wants to do some of the budget, specifically the Homeland Security funding, after the election because he feels the Senate will pick up seats. But is there not a danger in that because the House might flip? There, there is. I mean, that is a danger as it, as it comes every election. I mean, this is why elections have consequences. But I think they believe that the fight is going to be too great um, leading into the elections because, one, if there's a second government shutdown um, with a Republican-controlled Congress, the objects are not great for congressional republics, Republicans facing um, tight, tight and tough elections. The second problem is that you know there are financial and economic repercussions for um, for a government shutdown, which also takes away from President Trump's right, message that he's doing. Here's what, let's talk about what's really let's talk about what's really going on. I don't think Trump expects anything more than perhaps nominal funding for a, the wall to build a mile of it. I think he knows there's not going to be a wall. It would seem to me what Trump is really doing, there's two parts to this strategy. One, he wants the wall discussion out there to fire up the Republican base in November, right? And two, what he'll do is you get closer to the September 30 deadline, he'll pull the wall and get something else. So isn't isn't it the case that Trump is just kind of smartly staking out a position with the wall and then will pull back and get something else? I totally agree with you. It seems like a page directly out of out of the deal. Um, I think the problem is that it just gives uh, congressional Republicans heart palpitations as they try and sort of um, negotiate these really complicated um, spending bills. But I think you're right. I think putting out that um, that rhetoric is a way to electrify his base. Um, and as you see, and, and I mean, it might also help uh, congressional Republicans that are leaning and hugging into Trump, you know, adopting his real really tough posture as a way to also um, get their uh, electorates out to vote. Let me Now, let's tell the viewers, let's kind of educate the viewers on what, it, what a shutdown actually means, because a lot of folks probably don't know. 
The government, in case you don't know, on September 30, the government runs out of money. That is, there is no more money in the accounts in all these agencies to pay workers, to pay this, to pay that. So they can't stay open if Congress doesn't authorize after September 30. That's what a shutdown technically means. Now, usually in the case of a shutdown, there's broad agreement that we keep paying our military because we have to. We keep paying Homeland Security. Social Security continues. Medicare continues. The most essential things continue. Other non-essential things like uh, housing and urban development, Department of Commerce, Department of Transportation, all this junk in the government, that's what shuts down. You know, Naomi, I have a theory, and I think I think what Trump should do, if I were Donald Trump, this is what I would do. I would take a chance. I would throw the dice, and I, I would shut the government down, keeping all the essentials open, and I would take the position, and every day I would come out and say, what are you really missing, people? The Department of Transportation is shut down. Commerce is shut down. Department of Energy is shut down. I would tell the public, are your lives changing because the Department of Energy is shut down? And people would come to realize just how bogus a lot of these departments are. The Department of Energy employs 67,000 people. You know, Reagan once quipped about the Department of Agriculture. If present trends continue, the Department of Ag will employ more, employ more people in 30 years than work in agriculture in the United States. But that's how right am I? Well, I think it would it would be a very unconventional approach to to this shutdown politics. But I mean, we're talking about a very unconventional president, and I think some of your your point. Um, things through. I think one problem is is that government workers are also voters. Like, I mean, they may not vote Republican, but they are also an important constituency. And I think, too, um, the, the, I mean, it's a, another way. I mean, this president has come under fire for not tackling deficits that are actually rising under his administration in comparison to other administrations. And I think that is one way that um, the Office of Management and Budget, Budget you know, Director I, I have, would work, agree with you. I absolutely detest bureaucrats. And one of my fetishes, one of the things I love to see is a bureaucrat without a paycheck. That literally turns me on. I look forward to that. I absolutely look forward. It's one of my all-time fetishes. I love to see bureaucrats running out of money because most of these people, there's some good ones, but most of these people are very bad. Most of these people want to, uh, this telecommuting, they have a, a one-day work week where all they're doing is scamming and robbing the American people. So I, there is no greater delight for me than watching a bureaucrat without a paycheck. Okay, now, what would you do? I'm a little worried about congressional Republicans here because I see McConnell. I see McConnell's strategy. He's pretty much assured of gaining at least one seat in the Senate. But I don't understand this business with the House. Even if things go well for Republicans, we still lose seats in the House. Uh, Ryan, if you do a lame duck session, Ryan and McCarthy will be working with uh, far fewer seats than they have now. So that strategy worries me on a number of levels. Because there certainly won't be good news in the House. I actually think don't I, I don't think Democrats will take the House, but at a minimum we're gonna be working with lesser numbers. Given that I can't see why you'd wanna do DHS or any other approach in lame duck. Well I guess I think that they they're taking um you know, calculations of, of, you know, what they know as well as different polling measures and things like that. I think that they um are like trying to figure out the best strategy because they 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 don't want a shutdown to take away from their other accomplishments, right? Because this is going to happen just before the midterm elections. By by playing up the government shutdown, it can take away from things like their tax, like your, their tax reform and different other wins that they've had. Um, and so I think that that's probably playing in um, with their with their calculus. I mean, whether you agree with it or not, I think that's what is that's um, going thinking. to happen. <laughs> Naomi Lean, breaking news reporter, Washington Examiner. Thank you so much. If we're real lucky, we'll be able to have you back again. Stay tuned. More to come. All the stories and controversies that no one talks about, but everyone should know about. Some people without brains do an awful lot of talking. Behind the Curtain with Jack Berkman. Coming up next, we'll be talking about how the low population, more on population, kind of a continuing theme here on Behind the Curtain, how our low population hurts our economy and hurts America's leadership in the world. Stay tuned. Not enough babies in this country. Don't miss it. That's coming up next. 
Remember, if you want to take something behind the curtain, you call us, 703-795-5364. 703-795-5364. Operators are standing by 7 a.m. to 5 p.m. Monday through Friday, uh, 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. on Saturday, all times Eastern Standard Time. Taking your emails now, Jack Berkman 2016 at Gmail. Coming into the 20th century, at least, but never the 21st. We're joined now by Teresa Payton, CEO of Fortalis Solutions, for a topic I love, and it's a dangerous topic. And all you libertarians out there, you really want to wake up. If, if, if I haven't got you awake, I want everybody up and awake for this one. If you're a libertarian, you want to, ha- you want to hear this segment. Basically, what's going on are a lot of these drug companies like GlaxoSmithKline and others, many others, are selling the DNA data they have on you. Like if you're in a doctor's office, medical situation, you give, you give up blood DNA data. These drug, this stuff ends up in the hands of drug companies. They are selling it uh, for various research purposes, commercial purposes, and they are making money off your DNA. Teresa, welcome. Thank you for having me on today. Well, this sounds pretty egregious. What's happening here? Well, and, you know, this is one of those things where I think we've all realized that when we use free services, such as free email, free social media, we realize we're the product for sale. We get targeted ads. um, We get upset when we hear our data is sold about us without it being anonymized. But for the most part, we kind of shrug our shoulders and say, yeah, I know I'm the product. But in this particular case, Many people paid for a service, and so 23andMe, Ancestry.com, GED Match, all of these different DNA services which talk about understand what diet you should be on if you want to lose weight, understand what your future health issues might be. All right, so 23andMe, okay, a lot of good stuff here. 23andMe is a genetics testing company. Now, they've partnered with GlaxoSmithKline, with GSK. So GSK had the data and essentially they are selling it to 23andMe, correct? Well, actually, 23andMe is selling your data now to Big Pharma. To, oh, it's and, the other way around. So 23andMe yes. is selling to GSK. Now, how does 23, how does 23andMe get my data? Well, you buy a kit and you send it away to them to find your long-lost ancestors or to get the diet that's right for you or to learn about your health. And when you do that, you have an opportunity to opt into different sharing options. And one of the more benign-sounding data sharing options says, you know, are you willing to share this with the Genome Project? And I think most people would say, well, gosh, if my DNA can help end a heart disease, yeah. Wow. Yeah, so is this, anyway. the, is this the real hidden subtext? Is this the real purpose of sites like Ancestry.com? Are they essentially, is that why they really exist? Is that how they really make money? It's a front for the drug companies? Is that what's going on? Well, I, you know, I want to believe that they started off with truly wanting to provide Ancestry services and then found this opportunity to help move things along with genealogy searches. You know, if you and I don't really know our great grandmom's name or it was misspelled at Ellis Island or whatever it is, and we often hit these dead ends. And if you can add to a genealogy search, DNA matching, that can help. But we're now in this really strange period where the technology can offer amazing things. It can solve murder cases. It can be sold to, to Big Pharma, your DNA, to create tomorrow's next cure for something. Now, what does Big Pharma, when GSK gets this, what do they do with it? Right. So they could work with, you know, uh, a Glaxo. They could work with, you know, any of the kind of the big drug companies and say, hey, we've got the genetic makeup of somebody whose ancestors are from these parts of the world. These parts of the world are known to have cancer or Um, this type of heart disease or sickle cell anemia or whatever it is, and here you go. You can have their DNA, and you can do all kinds of testing uh, against that DNA to develop the next miracle cure drug. So it helps them uh, basically speed up the cycle for R&D at the pharmaceutical companies. Now, all of this is essentially going on unregulated. I mean, see, I have this theory that government does... Most of the things, it, government does everything it shouldn't do and nothing it should do. Shouldn't there be regulation like this? It doesn't seem like there's any, I mean, the FTC's investigating, 
But nobody has any real regulation to stop this or regulate it. Not really. And so the FTC, you said that, right, they are investigating. And uh, and here's the thing. You know, there's kind of this law all of us in the United States know called HIPAA. And so, like, if you have a family member who's really ill and you show up at the hospital and you say, doctor, tell me what's going on, they say, well, unless they filled out a HIPAA patient sharing form, I can't tell you anything. And so you would think that your and my DNA would fall under HIPAA. Clearly, there's some workarounds going on there. And again, you know, we're sort of in this space of just because we can does it mean we should? And, uh, you know, I don't know if you followed the Golden State Killer. He's behind bars. And you, you know how they finally figured out who they No, the tell us. I forget. Was, tell right? us. Okay, so they were not kind of coming up empty. DNA was left at one of the murder scenes. I mean, these are heinous crimes. And so I'm so glad that this the law enforcement was very clever and very creative um, but what they did was they took the DNA from the crime scene they ran it through GED match didn't get an exact match but got the most likely relatives and then uh, based on investigations I've I have worked on in the past I'm going to assume what they did next was they matched them up to property records they matched those um, potential relatives up to birth records and through process of elimination found somebody who was not in the GED match registry that maybe could have been their man. And they went ahead and arrested the individual. He has since um, admitted to these heinous crimes, and I hope it brings the victim's family some peace of mind that, you know, it doesn't bring their loved so, ones back. In other words, how do you see this? So kind of back to the original topic, when you have companies like 23andMe, genetic uh, testing companies, selling to Big Pharma, GSK, and others, and not just 23andMe, probably many companies, small companies like that, that, that get this stuff and sell it because they got it from Ancestry.com and wherever. Do you see this? I'm coming at, I, I, I'm seeing the dangers in this. It sounds like you see a mixed situation where you have both pluses and minuses, would you yourself, does Teresa Payton, call for higher regulation of this? You know, I always, um, regulation to me sometimes is well intended, but in practice is really awful, right? So you create this whole regulatory body, you create a ton of expenses, you have regulators come out who don't really know what they're always, what they're looking for because it's an emerging um, issue and so you know it could also stifle innovation and creativity of the next uh, DNA collection company. But I do agree with you. I would love to see more oversight and and I do believe, like for example, if your listeners, if this concerns them, which it should, um, if they spoke up to ftc.gov and their online form and said this is not okay, I want to hear. What are the data collection practices? What are the data security practices? Do you anonymize the data? One more. One more. Do we want to issue a warning in about, about, only about a minute left? Do we want to issue a warning to consumers to not check that box on sites like Ancestry.com? Do we want to go ahead now and urge them not to do that? Until we get the proper oversight and understanding, do not share. At some point, it will be incredibly beneficial to the greater good, but we do not have an understanding, which means your privacy and security could be All right, ladies and gentlemen, we're telling you here, our expert is telling you, I'm joining in that call. Be careful the boxes you check on Ancestry.com and sites like that because it can be very dangerous to you with Big Brother knowing more and more and more about you and your family. Teresa Payton, thank you so much. If we're real lucky, we'll have you back again. Teresa Payton, ladies and gentlemen, CEO of Fortalis Solutions. We'll be right back. where everything is depicted as a Washington Post political cartoon. Behind the Curtain with Jack Berkman. And up next, we're going to be talking all about is America at a crossroads? Are we going to still be a world leader? Will we still be a world power? Are we falling from within like Rome? Are we Rome? Coming up in just a few seconds. But remember, if you want to take something behind the curtain, you call us 703-795-5364. 703-795-5364. Operator standing by. 
Monday through Friday, 7 a.m. to 5 p.m., Saturday, 10 a.m. to 5 p.m., all times Eastern Standard Time, taking your emails, jackberkman2016 at gmail, jackberkman2016 at gmail, same number, same email, if you know anything about the Seth Rich murder mystery, it is heating up. We're about to have the next dump of information. The Seth murder will be solved. We will never quit on the family. We'll never quit on the city of Washington. We will honor our commitment to solve this murder. Well, joining us now, John Smirak, senior editor at The Stream. John, welcome. Thank you. Good to be on. Well, so this topic here, it's kind of an unusual topic. We're taking a step back from day-to-day politics how do, it's a very broad topic. How do we see America? Are we still the preeminent nation in the world? Are we declining? Are we Rome? Is it inevitable that we're Rome? Are we, are we being eclipsed by China? Will we be eclipsed by China? Are we a hegemon in a multipolar world? What do you think? Well, um, I talk about a lot of these things in my new book, The Politically Incorrect Guide to Immigration, where I, I go into what is America? How do we define it? How did immigration shape America? And how is the current wave of immigration, which is very different from previous waves, uh, challenging and maybe undermining our, our, current, our current American identity? And, and we see that the Democrats have really bet the farm on this. Uh, now, the I, think I, know, I think I know where you're going with this. And tell me if you agree with me. One of the things, one of the big problems I have with the current direction of the country, I mean, we're all immigrants. Or we're all, except Native Americans, every one of us is an immigrant. My family, I'm half Italian. The Italians came to this country at the turn of the 20th century. I think uh, my, on my mother's side, they came in the year 1905, 1910, somewhere around there, through Ellis Island, then on to Pittsburgh, just like, just same way as millions of other people. But here's the difference between then and now. My people wanted to integrate. You know, the old Italians, when the children would speak Italian at the dinner table, they would slap them and they say, no, you speak English. You speak English. That's not being done today. See, the Italians were successful because they integrated into the society. The Irish did the well, same also, thing. Well, also, the society Everybody demanded it. Let me ask you. The society demanded it. There was demanded. no welfare state. One out of three Italian, Ameri- Italian immigrants went back. One out of three. How many immigrants from America, in America today decide they can't find a job, it's not comfortable, so they go back? Now, you don't get one in three because we have a welfare state that traps. Even for illegals. We've, we've essentially got a whole welfare state even for illegals. That's right. Their kids get free education. The kids get Medicaid. Their kids, I mean, it, it, you are better off on American welfare than you are working hard in large parts of the world. Think about that. You are better off just collecting a check from the government, maybe getting something through affirmative action in America as, it, as, it, as an immigrant without a job than you would be if you went back to Honduras or Mexico but and worked 50, even more dan- I, I love that point, but even more dangerous than that is the separatism. Like if you look at the Hispanic community, and somewhat it's difficult to talk about the Hispanic community because they're really 18 different groups. It's a very, uh, the right. media says Hispanics, that's 18 or 20 different groups of people it does, or more. It doesn't make a lot of sense to use that word. But the problem is the Hispanic leadership uh, like the African American leadership is encouraging separatism. That is, speak. We want you to speak Spanish, and you know, Bank of America and Wells Fargo. They now have everything in English and Spanish. Diversity, in and of itself, is not a good thing. What is a good thing is diversity with common culture. Diversity with common culture, with common language, with common tradition. Diversity with integration. Diverse societies historically fail. Like if you look at Austria-Hungary or the Soviet Empire, or for that matter, the Persian Empire, for that matter, the Russian right. or the uh, Roman Empire, they all, they collapse. But what has made America different is diversity with all that commonality, right? Right. Right. And, and actually now that school textbooks in America, I've got a chapter on this in the book, are school textbooks the ones that are official in California, which is our largest state and imposes itself on many other states? They just adopt California's books. Their, their U.S. history book teaches that the assimilation of immigrants, that encouraging immigrants to learn English and become loyal Americans was racist. That it was racist to expect all those Southern Europeans, like my grandfather, who came from Croatia in 1916, it was racist to expect him to learn English and adhere to American democracy. If you're going to be teaching that to the kids you're trying allegedly to assimilate, how on earth is it ever going to happen? So we would be, under that logic, we would be exactly like 
the Aust- we would be exactly like Austria Hungary, and we would already have met the same fate because you'd have people. You'd have uh, 16 different major languages in the United States. People would be speaking right. Polish and Italian and Croat and Russian right. and on down the line. And there would be no commonality of any kind. America would never have been, we would have never won World War II. We would never, we would never have even won the Civil War. We would have, the Civil War, <laughs> and, and furthermore, um, the other effect of mass immigration is, is, is also destructive. Right now, we bring in almost a million low-skill workers every year, at the same time that we've outsourced low-skill jobs to third-world countries. And as a result, the average working man, the working-class woman, the wor- average working-class salary in America has not risen in 45 years adjusted for inflation. They have been st- economically stagnant because supply and demand. The demand for their labor is reducing as we outsource jobs, and we, we're constantly flooding them with competitors brought in from other countries. The irony is millions the, of people the policies, don't have high school diplomas. The policies of the far left are destroying the working man. And I don't even know if Bernie Sanders is smart enough to know this. I don't know if... Uh, if all of these socialists know that their policy, their immigration policies are essentially destroying the American working man and the American union. Now, Donald Trump, to his credit, has turned this around and we're now seeing numbers for the first time. We see wages going up. We see relative right. differences shrinking. Trump, as a conservative Republican, is really the first president ever to address this. Right, and the Koch brothers, who are ra- radical open borders libertarians, are angry about that, and they're threatening to try to destroy Trump. They're, they're these libertarian multi- hunt- billionaires, and they're they're going to pour money into never Trump candidates and even support see, I, Democrats. I, I, I have they're a upset. theory. I have a theory on this. We'll see if you agree with me. In the at the ter- beginning in the twentieth century, we started using the words immigration and emigration because they're nice, neutral sounding words. But what's going on today is the same debate that America has been bedeviled by since the get-go, and that is the slavery debate, the slavery question. We don't use the word slavery. What the Cook brothers want to do, what the Chamber of Commerce want to do, they want to run slave ships. They want to bring all these people in. Now, nobody ties them down and puts them on plantations and beats them, but the society is richer. These people, a lot of the people coming over the border are the equivalent in relative terms of modern day slaves. And the, the especially illegal immigrants, illegal my, immigrants are not protected by workplace re- protections, by insurance, by any of the safety things. They basically work under the conditions of people in 1880. It's you slavery. Know? I mean, every labor law we pass is nullified by the fact that employers don't have to check if a, someone is legal to work in the country. Most Americans don't realize that employers do not have to check if you are legal to work in this country. There is a program called E-Verify. The Fed set it up. It's voluntary. Paul Ryan has fought to keep it voluntary. Why? What conceivable reason can there be to let illegal workers with stolen Social Security numbers work in America? Well, it's just because, well, I think the answer is because the chamber, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce wants to run slave ships, just like a lot of American business always did. But we don't learn our lesson. Slavery is bad and it's wrong. And more than that, it doesn't work. It caused the Civil War and 600,000 deaths. And it's still causing problems today. We have most all of the labor we need in the United States. But so people can squeeze out additional profits. Certain groups can do that. We are running slaves. And, and I have argued that I've argued that for a long time. If I were in Congress, I would get rid of the word immigration, bring back the word slavery and tell the American people the evil we are really dealing with. Well, you know, it was it, the real force behind ending slavery in the 19th century. It was not just the abolitionists who made a very strong moral case based on the Bible. It was It was the free soil people. It was ordinary workers who didn't want to have to compete with slave labor. So you can combine a moral cause with a a cause of legitimate self-interest. And I think Trump combines the moral cause of defending Christians and other religious groups in America from government persecution, defending the rights of the unborn to live, defending our nationhood and defending the economic interests of the working man and woman who has been completely neglected by, by the libertarian right who, who wants to use them as cheap labor and by the multiculturalist left, which is just a given up. John Smear, running class. out of time. Last few seconds. What is your book again? 
I want to the make politically sure. incorrect guide to immigration. The politically incorrect guide to immigration. John Smirak, senior editor of the Stream. John, if we're real lucky, we'll be able to have you back again. Stay tuned. Coming back soon. All the stories and controversies that no one talks about, but everyone should know about. Why don't you get a toupee with some brains in it? Behind the Curtain with Jack Berkman. Welcome back. In just a minute, we'll be talking about the ill effects of America's small population. This is a theme that Behind the Curtain has been on for some time. But remember, if you want to take it behind the curtain, if nobody's listening to you, if your local press won't help, call us, 703 795-5364, 703-795-5364. Operators standing by 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. Monday through Friday, 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. on Saturday. We're ready to take your call. We're ready to take your issue to Congress, and we'll do it for free. We don't want anything from you. We just want to know what you need. And if your local press won't help you, behind the curtain will. Also, remember, same number, 703-795-5364. Jack Berkman, 2016, at Gmail, if you know anything about the Seth Rich murder mystery. More coming on that soon. Well, joining us now, Jordan Goodman, frequent wonderful contributor uh, to this program, personal finance finance expert, America Money Answers Man. That's like that's like that old thing, Jordan, where you would say toy boat, toy boat, toy boat. Remember that one? You, how many times can you say Money Answers Man without screwing it up? Welcome, Jordan. No, no, America's Money Answers Man. That's what people call me. I love it. And and that is a well-earned and well-deserved title because you are exactly that. Okay, I want to talk, we've talked about so many economic themes with you, but one thing I want to talk to you about today that we haven't talked about, I am very concerned about the smallness of America. And that is, if you look into the future, my feeling is that demography might just be destiny. And right. That's, and that's what worries me. How can we compete... Okay, so, you know, we have this left-right battle, and obviously you and I are on the right, and yes, I believe in a free market system, but all of the difference between left and right is the difference between growing America at 1% like a Barack Obama and even 7 or 8% like Donald Trump. But my point is a broader one. If you take a step back and take a deep look, even if we grow at 8% forever, we're still not going to be able to compete with 3 billion-plus Asians. That is correct. And so what's happening is we are not replacing our population, our birth rate. Uh, typically, if you have two child uh, per family, you replace your uh, population. And we're under that. We're about 1.6, last numbers I heard, uh, because people of childbearing age are either not having children at all or they're having them later and later in life. Um, and some people are just going childless. So we are not replacing our population. We're getting older and, and older. It's even worse than that in that our fertility rates are even lower than Europe, Japan, and Russia. But the problem is we have enough immigration to offset that, whereas Europe really doesn't. Europe has even worse problems with immigration than we do. And Japan and Russia are actually losing people because of the low birth rate. We, too, would be losing people, but for immigration, which brings a whole nother can of worms and a whole nother group of problems. Well, when we're restricting immigration, both legal and illegal. So that has always been the escape valve for us in the past. And that's why you're seeing labor shortages, Jack, in many areas. But go to construction sites. You can't find people to work at them. But one of the problems, and people, it's very controversial to talk about this so people don't want to. One of the problems is that the top 80% or 85% of the society is basically not breeding. And certainly the top half of the society is not breeding. I mean, it's any society that essentially breeds out the bottom doesn't have much of a future, right? And, you know, if you look back in time, uh, top-grade families from the top of society would have four, five, six children. That was common if you go back 100 years. We're not doing that anymore. Correct. That, that can seal our doom. It is a problem. I mean, you look at what's happening now in Japan, um, Italy, other places, similar. I mean, the, Japan's a very old society in many ways. Actually, another interesting place, Jack, is China. Now, they had the one-child policy for many, many years. I, I was in China somewhat recently, and they said, <clears throat> had they not had the one-child policy, there would be 400 million people more in China than there are today because they only had and one And it gets child. even worse. The Chinese story is even sadder because if you go back to the Mao days and you look at 1947 to the, to the mid-1970s, 
you have a situation where, I mean, Mao is probably the greatest butcher in history. He probably killed more people than Hitler and Stalin combined. And uh, probably the numbers I'm getting, are, I mean, you, you, you could, it could be upwards of 100 million plus that he killed. Had you not had that tragic killing, I mean, had you not done the one-child policy, had you not had the tragic actions of Mao, China could well be over 3 billion people, in, in which case it would be a total zoo and a total disaster. Yeah, but I mean, from our point of view, you are correct. You need a growing population uh, to grow the economy. I mean, we're growing at a 4% GDP rate right now, which is pretty amazing considering the baby boom is retiring. 10,000 people a day turn 65. Trump's and- done a brilliant job with what he has to work with. But the bottom line in this country, because of the aging population, because of the smallness of it, uh, Trump doesn't have a whole lot to work with. So, I mean, do you think, what are the causes of this? And again, let's get real controversial. My feeling is the main cause of all of this is the feminist movement. Because feminism means, when, with the, see, we delude ourselves. If you look at the last 50 years, a lot of the growth we've had is because women and minorities have entered the workplace. Whereas if you go back 50 years ago, the only people really working in the United States, at least in full-time jobs, were, were white males. So you bring women into this calculation, it's easy to see how the country has become a lot richer. We have become richer, but we, in some sense, I would argue, have sown the seeds of our own destruction because we don't have enough children specifically children from the top half of the society. Correct. So women, uh, I mean, either they have no children at all, or they certainly wait till their mid to late 30s or even 40s to have one child because they want to establish their careers, which I guess you could say is because of feminism. I think it's good they have careers, but we need children uh, as well. And you're right. Actually, it's interesting. Just this last weekend, I was in Newport, and I was seeing some of the mansions, uh, the the breakers and all that kind of thing. Why is it up there? Big, uh, in those days, the Vanderbilts and the Astros, they had big families, and they needed those big The mansions. Rockefellers, the Melons, all of them. Exactly. All <laughs> Today, of them. you wouldn't need those kind of mansions, because they don't. maybe one kid, maybe maybe two. Uh, there was a whole story recently about the, the death of the middle child. There's people not having three kids anymore. So it, it is a long-term problem demographically, because the baby boom, which was the biggest you know, uh, surge of population, is now getting in the retired years, and and they're receiving benefits, they're not paying into the system as Let's much. take a careful look at where the world is now. I mean, a lot of people, I mean, clearly the U.S. is still number one. China is rising. I mean, would you, would you say in economic terms that we're developing a bipolar world with U.S. and China at the top, or do we still have the U.S. as a hegemon presiding over a multipolar system? How do you see the current world? No, I think the U.S., I mean, we're still number one, and we're throwing our weight around with all the tariffs and all that. But China is growing, uh, and Europe's doing better, not as much as you know they, they could be if they didn't have their kind of rigid policies. But Europe is still very large. For example, Europe just had a big uh, trade treaty with Japan, which was the largest trade treaty ever in human history, a quarter of the world's population there. As far as population growth, it's all happening in uh, India and Bangladesh and uh, you know poor people. Africa has a very high population rate. So around the world, uh, another place is the Arab world, Egypt and Iraq, very high population, but these people have nothing to do. But That's Europe, why they have 25% unemployment rates. Europe and Japan have so many internal problems, and Europe's birth rates are even lower, and Europe has even worse immigration problems with Arab immigration. These societies, I don't see Japan and Europe, Europe as having any kind of future. I see them really shrinking on the world stage. I see the U.S. and China emerging. And so let me ask you this. Let's take a look at some of this Chinese economic data because you're the expert. A lot of this, I I I don't know what to make, how to make heads or tails of it. The U.S. economy is about eighteen and a half trillion. The Chinese economy is eleven, eleven and a half trillion on most of the uh, statistics. Now that's not purchasing power parity; that's just raw numbers. Is the Chinese number of eleven trillion? How accurate do you think that is? Is that inflated? I mean, there's been so much growth in the last ten years. Is that could the number, real number, be half that? What do you suspect about China? I, don't, I think it's inflated somewhat, not half. But it's, I mean, I've been there, and you can actually see it. There's a huge amount of infrastructure that's been built all over the place, in Shanghai. And, and I mean, I, I took the bullet train from Beijing to Shanghai. It's five hours. And everywhere you're seeing apartment buildings going up. Office, a lot of times they're empty, <laughs> but it's part of GDP. So I think maybe they're at $10 trillion, something like that. But they're growing at a faster pace. They're growing at maybe... 
six percent, something like that. Although recently they're taking a big hit, they are losing the trade war, and you've seen this: the Chinese stock market fall sharply. And they're very much of an export-oriented country, and they're getting hurt more by the trade war than we are. We're much less of an export-oriented country than China. Maybe it's time for the U.S. to to use its leverage, just as Trump is doing. Maybe there comes a time when you think more about relative differences than absolute gain. And that's what's happening. We are using our leverage, and they're not happy about it. Now, whether they concede, I hope they do. I mean, the, the solution to this whole tariff situation, President Trump is right, if you get either no tariffs or much lower tariffs and fewer uh, protections and All price right, support. Jordan Goodman, yeah. we're going to leave it there. Personal finance expert, America's Money Answers Man. What a blessing to have you. We'll see you again soon. Well, thanks a lot, ladies and gentlemen. Remember, even when we're not on the air, you can hear us and see us and read all about us at jackberkmanradio.com and at radioamerica.com. See you next week. But I want to tell you now about something very special. My friends at my pillow and we are so proud to represent them these are if you have trouble sleeping these are some of the best pillows you could ever have they're 100 percent cotton they come with a 10-year warranty uh, my wife and i had trouble sleeping for years when we had my pillow all of that went away i i i can't remember the time we got our first four pillows it was a spectacular experience now my pillow a four pack right now if you want to buy four 50 percent off two premium two travel pillows uh, MyPillow.com or 1-800-923-8919, 1-800-923-8198-8919, promo code Berkman. Uh, MyPillow.com, 1-800-923-8919. If you want to take it behind the curtain, you call us, 703-795-5364, 703-795-5364. Taking your emails, jackberkman2016 at gmail. Jack Berkman 2016 at Gmail. Same number, same email. If you know anything about Seth Rich. Ladies and gentlemen, even when we're not on the air, you can hear us and see us and read all about us at jackberkmanradio.com. And of course, always at radioamerica.com. Thanks, and my voice is gone.